Open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And I'll explain why we're there. We are. That's why we're in Mark. One thing is really clear from Scripture. And that is, God does not want you to remain the same. Now, it's not that God doesn't love you the way that you are, because he does. He loves you crazy, just the way that you are. But it's because he loves you that he will not leave you as you are. So if you're worried, if you're looking at yourself right now saying, you know what, I'm perfect just the way that I am, <laughs> change is right around the bend. <laughs> if you can look at yourself and say, wow, there's so many things in me that need to change, you can be rest assured that he will. If you're looking at yourself and saying, well, there's some things in me that will never change, then I would suggest that you don't know the God that you're dealing with. Uh, yeah. Now, it all sounds good that God's going to do this. And it's good, and we can all intellectually agree in an abstract sort of way, that God transforming our lives is a good thing. But when God brings changes that are designed to transform me, things get a little uncomfortable then. It's okay if God's changing you because quite honestly, you really need, I'm not pointing at you, Elena. There's pointing at the imaginary person to my right over here. How many people see imaginary people here? I do, and it's right. You know, you obviously need to change. I, I obviously don't, but you obviously do. You know, but then all of a sudden, God's bringing changes into my life that are designed to transform me. And, it's, and it does get uncomfortable, but change we must for, and that is the title of this message this morning, no one stays the same. If you're a Christian this morning, God's already begun a great work of transformation in your life. If you're not a Christian and you've joined us here this morning, then he wants to begin a great work of transformation in your life, and he's ready to. Anytime you're ready to lay down your life. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, this is Jesus, he saw Simon, that of course is Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Lord Jesus, we just pray that this morning, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would just give us wisdom and insight into your word, into the, what these things mean for us right now, not just in general, not just philosophically or theologically, but what these words mean to me, as an individual, as a Christian, and how you want to impact my life with them. So Lord, give us open hearts and ears ready to receive what you have for us this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're beginning a, a new book series that we're calling Level Up, and um, you saw the graphic just a little bit earlier. And that's going to be a study through the book of First Peter, and kind of the general principle, of course, is that um, the subtitle, anyways, is Elevating Your Walk with Christ, is, is for a lot of us, um, especially if we've been walking with the Lord for a while, it's really easy to kind of get content with where we are at in our relationship to the Lord. Things are going along fine, we're fine, everything is groovy, you know, they're, you know we're, we're okay, kind of right the way that we are, not really thinking that, uh, gee, you know, God never wants us to stay just the way that we are. And um, so the idea behind this series call, that we're calling Level Up, Elevating Your Walk with Christ in First Peter, is to shake us up and to give us a little bit of a spiritual kick in the pants that it's time to not rest on our laurels, so to speak, but to apply some more energy and effort into our walk and relationship with Christ. But I thought, um, we did an introduction to this last week, and you can get a CD from the guys at the AV table if you like, uh, but I thought this week it might be fruitful if we kind of took a, one morning here and looked at where Peter comes from, because he's the guy that's writing the letter of First Peter, so where does he come from? What, what is his story? 
And, and really, when we get to the book of 1 Peter, why does he say some of the things that he says? And uh, that is because Peter went through himself uh, a great and amazing work of transformation. And in many ways, when we read about him, Peter, to me, has always been like a regular guy. You know, I look at somebody like the Apostle Paul, and he was just such an intellectual giant that it's like, wow, you know, okay, well, I mean, that's Paul, you know. And, and John, the, the, God, the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, he just always seems to have just an otherworldly quality and insight about him. But Peter is strictly blue collar. Um, he's a guy that, um, you know, if, if he was here, we'd go to In-N-Out together. And uh, he's, the kind of, he's the kind of guy that uh, he's like, hey, I'm going fishing. You want to go? And like, yeah, let's go fishing. And uh, so he sounds like a really regular guy. And I think part of that um, relatability, I guess, about Peter is his passion, that he loves Jesus so much, but he's a little bit impetuous, and a lot of times... His heart gets out ahead of his brain. And, and so sometimes he's just not really thinking. So he tends to leap into a thing without really thinking. He seems to, to mean well, but things don't always go well. Uh, he loves Jesus very much, but it doesn't always come out quite right. And he wants to do good, but doesn't. He wants to walk straight, but he falls. He's loyal, but he stumbles. He's a leader, but he's a failure. Uh, in short, he is us. So where in our history, where does this every man get his start? Well, he gets his start fishing here in Mark chapter 1, and that's why we're here. So point number one, it's up on the screen, it's on the handout that's in your bulletin, and this is where Jesus kicks in the door. Here in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, and it's also recounted in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. What I mean by this is that uh, for every one of us, at some point in our life, Jesus comes along and kicks in the door of our life. Now that certainly is what happened to me. And what I mean by that is one day I was not a Christian and then the next day I was. It was a miraculous transformation. For some people it's like that. For some people it's more of a time period than it is a specific day or hour. For me it was a nanosecond. It was a once I was that, now I'm this. And it was over that quick. And it may be a little bit abrupt for some, and it certainly was for Peter. Jesus is walking along, sees him and his brother fishing. He says to him, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And he gets up, and he follows them. Now, that seems odd to me. Because here he is working. He's at his job, working for a living. Now, if I'm at work and a stranger that I don't know walks along and says, follow me, I'm tempted to dial 911 because this is somebody unhinged is out here at my door telling me to follow. I'm not following you anywhere. I don't even know who you are, so forget it. But as, as irrational as it might sound when it says there in verse 18, they immediately left their nets and followed him. As much as you may want to get up and just leave work, that doesn't always work out so well, but Peter did. Okay, so let's look over at Luke chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke, you can't miss it. It's the next one over. Luke chapter 4, in verse 38 and 39, there's just a little bit of a backstory here. And so let's piece together some of these portions of the backstory. Luke chapter 4 verse 38 and 39. Now he, that's again, that's Jesus. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. That's Peter. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever and they made request of him concerning her and he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her and immediately she arose and served them. So Peter's mother-in-law is ill, and Peter's wife, who we don't ever read about again, we have no idea what happened to her, 
somebody puts in the request for Jesus to come over to her house. There's this lady over here. It's my mom. She really needs your healing touch. Can you stop in and see her and heal her? And Jesus does. Now, they, it doesn't say anything about Peter being there, which I, kind, I think is kind of interesting. It doesn't say that Peter was there and witnessed the whole thing. He might have. He might not have. I don't know. There's no way, there's no way to know. But he heals his wife's mother, his mother-in-law. Now then, if you're still in Luke chapter 4, look at Luke chapter 5. And in uh, Luke chapter 5, uh, let's pick it up in verse 4 instead of verse 5. Jesus, he's speaking from a boat. The boat that he's speaking, of, ha speaking from happens to belong to Peter, Simon. And, and so Jesus, after he gets done speaking to the crowd from the boat... He tells Peter, he says, launch out in the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered him and said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Always fascinating when you look at the disciples. Anytime you see them fishing, they're never catching anything. The only, the only time, the only, I know, it's, the only time they ever catch anything is when Jesus tells them to fish. There's like 87 sermons packed into that idea, and I won't go through all of them now. So Peter's got an idea here. Jesus commandeers his ship, and Peter willingly says, okay, I'll, I'll pitch out a little bit from shore, and you can speak from here. And then when Jesus says to him, launch out in the deep and, and let down your nets for a catch, Simon refers to him as master. That's interesting because that word that he's used there literally means the captain of this ship. So already Peter has this idea of who Jesus is. Perhaps he has already said, I'm going to follow this guy for whatever reason. Peter's mother-in-law has already been healed. And so he, lets, he goes out into the deep and he lets down his nets and, he, and, he, uh, and when they had caught a great number of fish, their nets were breaking, and he signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. So here comes another boat. They've got so many fish. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. That's a lot of fish. Remember, these guys are professional fishermen, so they know what's going on. So what is Peter's reaction there in verse 8? Simon Peter saw it, and he fill, fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now there's some recognition. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And, all, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid from now on. You will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Fascinating. Like many of us now, we can look back and we can see the circumstances that God used to bring us to him. Can you do that? I can. I can see things in my life that at the time appeared to be really fairly random events. But I can look back now and say, oh, yeah. I, yeah, he was, yeah. Oh, now I get it. Not random events at all. I mean, this, this, God will use the strangest things to bring you to himself. I know Susie's here today. I hope you don't mind me mentioning the story of how you, we met you and Mike. You know, because at one couple that was fellowshipping here, um, Barry and Barbara, some of you guys know them, uh, would vacation fairly regularly in Maui and then go to the Calvary Chapel, uh, Calvary Chapel West Side, right? And they met Susie's parents there. And, and they said Susie works down here at the Ritz-Carlton and her, and her boyfriend. And because Barry and Barbara vacationed over there, we ended up hooking up and meeting Mike and Susie, and I did their wedding, and now she's here for church this morning too. So I mean, it's just it's just the weirdest stuff that God uses, seemingly random things. Now, it's never just one thing, right? It's always 
seems to be a pattern of things that happened. But no matter what it was, we can look back and see that he used those things to lead us straight to him. Even though we didn't see it at the time, we can see it in retrospect. That's 2020 vision, right? Looking back. But let's also remember something else important here. If you're a Christian this morning, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God today, it was Jesus who came to you. It was Jesus that called you and it is Jesus that will complete what he has begun in you. That's the promise of Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It's not that you just woke up one day and say, hey, you know what, my life is going so good. You know, I got I got a job, you know, I got a home, I got a beautiful family, everything's going great. I must need a savior. And it just, it just doesn't work that way. It, I've never seen it work that way, anyways. Now it's impossible to tell what was in Peter's mind. But we don't have to look very far to see the results. Jesus said, follow me, and he followed him. Peter just got up, and he never looked back. And I got that made me think, too. Peter never really looked back. Jesus said, follow me, and he did. Do we ever look back and desire the former days? Just got thinking about that. Do we ever look back and desire the former? You know what happens, though, with our past? We tend to romanticize it. Oh, <laughs> some of you have done that. Was it really that cool or that fun or that exciting to be passed out on the floor of a nightclub <laughs> where people have been drinking and vomiting and spitting and everything else and you're there with your face pressed up against that same floor <laughs> or you've asked your girlfriend hold my hair while I throw up into the toilet I had a ponytail I had to ask my girlfriend to hold my hair while I threw up the toilet <laughs> You know, there's a problem, an obvious problem with looking back. And that is when you look back, you're going to trip over your present. Can't really see where you're going if you're constantly casting those glances back over your shoulder. And I can tell you from my experience anyways, any time I've tried to dabble in my past, it's gone far worse than I ever imagined that it would. Remember, sin promises everything and delivers nothing. Sin is what makes you look back and say, hey, you know, that wasn't so bad. Maybe I could do, you know, a little. I mean, I'm not going to like go nuts like I used to, but a little, there's, that's no big thing with that, is there? Until you do it. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, passages you're familiar with, I know. Brethren, I do not count myself as to have apprehended but one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Look, the memories remain, right? The memories remain, but I don't have to dwell there, I don't have to live there. Matter of fact, I want to move forward because it seems to me, at least according to verse 14, that if I follow Jesus, it's upward. And that's really where I want to go. I want to keep moving upward. Okay, so Jesus kicks in the door of my life. My life has never been the same. He said, follow me. I followed him. Here I am all of these years later. So point number two. Here's something else that happens. Peter's life was transformed, he followed Jesus. Well, something else is going to happen is Jesus is going to stretch your faith. Matthew chapter 14. Jesus is going to stretch your faith. You guys know this story well. You've heard it a zillion times. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples. This is Matthew 14, 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. You guys get in the boat, go on ahead. I'll meet you over on the other side. I don't know what the disciples were thinking. He'll get a boat later or 
whatever. Um, he'll take his hovercraft over. I don't know. He's, uh, he's sending us ahead. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now on the fourth watch, fourth watch, I think that's 3 a.m. Fourth watch is 3 a.m. Come on, guys. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, either way, we're going to call it 3 a.m., somewhere around in there. Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. I don't know. You know, I don't know. I, you know, when you see something that just can't happen, because you just, you can't do that. People can't walk on the water, and Jesus is a people, and he's walking on the water, and you just can't do that. So I don't know how discombobulated you feel when you see something that just can't happen. And then Jesus, you know, I love Jesus, but this sounds a little weird to me. Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Oh, you know, we're in a storm. We're afraid. We're professional fishermen, and we know this is a bad thing, being a storm out here in the middle of the lake, and you're walking out here in the water, and you're telling us, be of good cheer. <clears throat> I'm struggling with that, personally. But Peter, Peter, our man, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said come. Peter, what a dude. I mean, I, I would not have thought in a thousand years to say a thing like that. It might have been, you know, well, come over here and show me that you're Jesus. You know, what are you doing walking on the water? Get in the boat. I, I don't know what I would have said. Or if I just would have been just, you know, losing my lunch there, which is probably what I would have been doing. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. I like this. Now, the Sea of Galilee was about 13 miles long, about 8 miles wide. Not huge, but big enough to have its own weather conditions. And that's what they run into. As they sail, the weather goes bad. Jesus walks out to them on the water. They all react in fear. Peter calls out, Lord, if it's you... That request is a strange one. If you ask me, if it's you, if it's you, Lord, command me to come to you out there on the water. I don't know why he would have said such a thing. But it would seem that he believed that if this really was Jesus, then he could certainly bring him out on the water, just as he was out on the water. It's Jesus, after all. It's not just a dude. It's Jesus. And if that's really Jesus, then commanding me to come out on the water should be no difficulty at all. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus can enable you to go wherever he goes? Yeah, it's, e it's easy to say yes, isn't it? Until the next big nasty thing happens in your life, and you start going, oh, Lord, oh, I'm sinking. I'm going to die here. This is horrible. Do you believe that Jesus can enable you to go wherever he goes? But this moment is far more for Peter. It's far more than proving it was Jesus. Peter may not have realized fully what he was asking, but what he was asking, he was asking Jesus to enable him to do the impossible. That's what he's asking. him. Look, we, we got this whole idea. Yes, God will enable me. God will enable me to do whatever he calls me to do. Ah, okay. We, we can agree on that. But do you believe that Jesus can enable you to do the impossible? Whatever the impossible might be in your life. Because there's some things that we're going to approach in life or we're going to look at it and we're going to say, it's just, I can't do it. I just can't. It's not possible for me to do it. Now, Peter could have stayed in the boat too because Jesus says, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You guys know the story. 
Peter could have stayed in the boat and said, no, Lord, I have faith. And my faith is that if you tell me that I can, I can. I believe you, Jesus. And he never had to get out of the boat, right? But if he never got out of the boat, he never actually would experience for himself that what Jesus said was true. So he had to get out of the boat. You got to get out of the boat too. Sometimes you just got to get out of the boat and find out. Look, what's the worst thing that can possibly happen? Jesus or Peter gets out of the boat and he's walking on the water to go to Jesus. I don't know how far away he was, but there's Peter and he's walking on the water. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. I mean, the lesson is easy there. The minute he takes his eyes off of Jesus, he begins to sink. And what happens? Jesus let him drown. You took your eyes off of me, now drown. <laughs> you guys know the story. <laughs> Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? We believe that, don't we? But you actually don't get to experience it until you get out of the boat. And sometimes when you get out of the boat, you're going to sink. And you're going to scream, Jesus, help me. And he's going to help you. And you're going to find out that you actually can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even if you're going down for the third time, you're not dead yet. Let me see a show of hands. How many people here are physically dead this morning? <laughs> Couple of half way up. Okay. You're not. You're not dead yet, so I guess Jesus isn't done with you yet, is he? So whatever it is that he's asking you to do, whatever it is that is before you right now, it ain't no thing for him. If, if you're looking and saying, the only way out of this is walking on the water, and I can't walk on the water, therefore I'm not going to get out of this. Jesus is like, are you joking me? Have you ever read my word? Walking on water, I do that all the time. It's a hobby of mine, walking on water. Look, Jesus will lead. Count on him for this. Jesus will lead you. The trick now is following him. That's the trick. Because you know what we want to do is we want to do our thing and ask him to bless what we're doing. And Jesus says, no, nah, I ain't going to bless that. <laughs> no, you want me to bless that? I ain't going to bless it. I don't think he talks that way, but it kind of does to me sometimes. <laughs> Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. John chapter 12, verse 26, whoever serves me must follow me. But if you plan to follow him, you can be assured that he will stretch your faith to the uttermost. Get out of the boat. This is what you got to do. Okay, point number three. Here's what you're going to do. You are going to do your best. That's what you're going to do. If you're a Christian this morning, you're going to do just what all the rest of us do, and we're going to get out there and we're going to do our best. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26 and verse 31. Here's Peter again. I love this guy. Jesus said to them, he's speaking to his disciples, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For as it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered, not anybody else. It was Peter, first guy to speak up. He answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, I assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Yeah, drop down to verse 36. And Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. 
and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Then if you'll turn over to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. I like this because um, Peter once again they come to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it says there, starting uh, about verse 7, they asked him again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I've lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it out and struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? My old pastor used to say that he cut off his ear because Peter was a fisherman, not a swordsman. He was aiming for his neck, and that's all he could get was the ear. And you guys know the story that Jesus healed Malchus's ear at that moment. Peter always meant well. He always was the first to pipe up, give great proclamations of loyalty. He was always there when Jesus needed him. He was first up to bat to defend Jesus, even if he had to pull out a sword and start swinging. The only problem is that in each one of these scenarios, he fails miserably. It seems like he was always trying to do his best, but things never seemed to go quite the way that he planned. And, you know, something that we know, we know that Jesus does not ask you for anything that he will not enable you to do. Jesus doesn't tell you to go do something and say, good luck, sucker, I hope it works out. He will actually physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally enable you to do what he commands you to do. But our intentions get in the way. And we have good intentions. We think we know what's best. And often we do our best only to find out that Jesus was leading some way else or somewhere else altogether. Well, this is my situation. And I think this is what Jesus wants me to do. So, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. Now bless it for me. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to bless that for you because that's not where I'm leading. See, what we tend to do, I know I've shared, with this, shared this with you before. We tend to do, here's my problem. And here are the three ways that Jesus can answer my problem. Right? He can give me a new job. He can give me an instant raise. Or he can leave a sack of money on my doorstep. Okay, any of those three, that's how he's going to do it. And for my part, in retrospect, I tend to look back and see that he never does anything the way that I think he's going to do it. As a matter of fact, things frequently go in a manner that I look back and go, I never ever would have thought of that. And yet that's exactly what he did. So that, you know, our moments where we think, okay, here's my problem and here's how Jesus is going to solve it, you're already wrong. It's like, why do we need to think and figure out how he's going to do it so we can be rest assured that when he does it, we can say, yeah, I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> That's how well I know the Lord. I knew he was going to do it that way. He always, see me and him, you know, we got this thing, you know, and, uh, and he always, he, I, you know, I tell him what to do. He always does it, you know. It's, yeah. That's why intentions are good intentions they only work when our intentions are mated to his commandments. Lord, it's my intention to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
there's a good intention and he'll bless that intention because it's mated to something that is specific in his word. Lord, I want to love my neighbor as myself. That is my intention here. God says, yeah, I'm going to bless that. But sometimes when you say, Lord, I am going to quit my job and just live off whatever you supply. <laughs> God says, you're going to be hungry. <laughs> Note again, in, uh, in places like John chapter 15, verse 14, John chapter 15, verse 10, that our following of Jesus is evidence of our love for him. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I want to love Jesus. I do love Jesus, and I want to demonstrate my love for him by, by doing that. Obedience is the command. Our job is to follow him. Now, we can dream up all kinds of things that we want to do for Jesus. I hear people say that all the time. Well, you know, I'm doing this for Jesus. And I'm like, awesome. Does he know that? I mean, does, he, does, does, does he command you to do that? Does he want you to do that? You know, I'm, I'm buying, you know, I'm going to buy season tickets for the Warriors this next year. And I think Jesus, I'm doing it for Jesus. Because there's Christians on the team and they need my support. I have to be there for them. You know, that's my intention to glorify God. By, yeah, I got an amen for Jason. To glorify God by spending money on Warriors season tickets. Now, Jason and I can justify that spiritually. I'm not kidding. We can. The rest of you may not be able to. So we can dream up all kinds of things that we want to do for Jesus. But has he really asked me to do that? Or are we blazing our own trail and just saying it's for him? From childhood, we're told to do our best. And as a child, we learn that sometimes our best isn't enough, or we fail. It's a good thing to learn how to fail. It's not a bad thing to fail at a thing. But oftentimes, our best falls far short. Point number four. And that is, you will fail miserably. Remember in, there in Matthew chapter 26, that Jesus had told Peter that he was going to deny him. Even though Peter said that he wouldn't, Jesus said, you will. That's up there in verse 34. Surely I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times, even though twice Peter said that he wouldn't. I won't, Lord. I would never do that to you. Lord, I belong to you. I would never get drunk again. Ever. Jesus, I would never do that. I would never start using again, Jesus. I would never fool around on my spouse, Jesus. I would never do that. Never. And then what happens? You do. You do. Sometimes it's better not to say never. Here's a, the here's a truth. Jesus expects you to fail. Right? You think it surprises him when you fail? You think somehow Jesus is in heaven going, oh my gosh, look what just happened. <laughs> like he didn't know that was going to happen. But it's a good thing that Jesus expects me to fail because I fail frequently. Notice too that when Peter told, or when Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny him, Peter defended himself. Even if, even if I have to die with you, I would never disown you. And then he does it three times. It's a funny thing as a Christian, and especially, I think, as an American Christian. Somebody born and raised here in the United Snakes of America, I, I genuinely think that we are raised here to think that everything in our life is performance-based. Everything. You either win or you lose, and that's true. If you tick all the boxes, you did good. If you tick more of the boxes than less of the boxes, you did good. If you only ticked a few of them, you didn't do very good. As I like to, I, you know, I told my nieces when they were growing up because they all did sports. I always told them, you know, if you don't win, don't come home. <laughs> it, it's not. It's not how you play the game. It's whether you win or lose. And. and <laughs> They'd always go, Uncle Brian, it's not that. We just have to do our best. I'm like, oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Sorry. <laughs> but sometimes we think our Christianity is performance-based. Sometimes we carry that same 
my idiotic sports philosophy over into our Christianity. In other words, I measure my walk with Jesus by how good I did today. If I did good today, I'm good. I keep a mental scorecard of my day. And I check all my little boxes. And if I get to the end of the day and I check more rather than less boxes, I did good today. I had a good day with Jesus today because I did good. The unfortunate part about that is that's not how it works. Obedience is the goal. And I want to obey him every single day. And I try. It's, it's evidence of my love for him. Remember John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. I'm motivated to obey by my love for him. Not because I'm afraid of consequences, but because I love him. But nowhere in scripture do I ever find a scorecard. Where do I ever find a scorecard? Now we look at a passage like Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we always think that means unbelievers. Every human being, all of us, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and then we become a Christian. How about if you ever go back and read Romans chapter 7 again and find out that, hey, even as a Christian, I still sin and fall short of the glory of God with some degree of regularity. And it really bothers me. I don't like that. I don't like it at all because I want to do good. But it still applies to us. We do, we will frequently fail. And you guys know the story from Matthew chapter 26, verse 69 to 75. Peter denied the Lord three times. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16 encourages us. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. See, I always got thinking that it's not the failure, it's what you do with it. Did I stumble and did I fall? Yep, and I know why. Because I was headstrong, I was selfish, I was self-centered, I was prideful. And I stumbled and I fell. Now what are you going to do about it? You're just going to wallow there in freakish misery? Or are you going to get up and move forward? God's, well, one of God's greatest gifts to humanity is the gift of repentance. Being able to come before the Lord and say, I've failed and I'm sorry. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Isn't that good to know? Good to know that no matter how many times I stumble and fall, I can always repent. That means I can see my sin for what it was. I can agree with God that this was a sin and I should not have done it. And I can turn the direction of my life and go the other way, away from where that sin is. You know what we say, right? If you're on a diet, you don't hang out at the bakery? Well, that's part of it. I turn and I go a different direction in my life, so I do my best to avoid those things that cause me to stumble and fall and sin. I, I've shared this quote before from Abraham Lincoln, where he says, my, um, my great concern is not whether you have failed, but whether you are content with failure. And sometimes in our spiritual life, we do the same thing. It's, oh, I can't ever get this Christian thing right. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I just can't ever do it right. Okay, yeah, you're going to stumble and fall. But are, are, is that it? You're just going to give up there and say, because I can't do it the way that I think that I ought to, I'm not going to do it anymore at all. All that means to me is you misunderstood the whole thing to begin with. Repentance is a gift. Failure is... Failure is an option, <laughs> and it happens a lot, but repentance is that incredible gift from God. Look, have you failed so bad that you don't think you can rise again? It's not true. If you think that you can never rise again after your failure, then you don't know Jesus, because he says you can. He can enable you to do the impossible. That brings me to my last point, point. and when the pastor says this is my last point, the body says... Amen. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So some of these people have been to this church before, you know. <laughs> but when the pastor says, this is my last point, that also means get out your sack lunch, take off your shoes. We're here for another hour at least. <laughs> John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Man, I've been to churches where the first hour and a half was just the singing part. That was before the preaching part, man. That was just the singing part. Point number five, and that is stumbling into the future. John chapter 21, verses 1 to 7. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, there he is again, Thomas, called a twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And so Peter said to them, I am the Pope, and I'm going to lead you spiritually from here on out. Oh, no, he didn't say that at all. Sorry. He said, I'm going fishing. So they said to him, we're going with you. And they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Peter, I love this guy. When the morning had now come, remember this is after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. When the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. They were far enough away, they couldn't tell that it was him. And Jesus said to them, children... I like that. that. That's funny, that term. In another translation, it's little boys. He calls to them. Children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. No. What are you guys asking us if we got food? We've been out here all night slaving over these hot nets. We don't have a single thing. And this guy's standing on the shore yelling at us if we have any food. No. Thank you for asking very much. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast. And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of the fish. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he would removed it, and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. John clues in first. John always had that kind of insight. And he says to Peter, it's the Lord, and I love Peter. I just love him. He just dives in and swims for sure. It's not a, none of this, oh, we'll be there in a minute. He cannot wait to get to Jesus. The last time he saw Jesus, he just denied him three times. And now here's Jesus standing on the shore. Sometimes when we fail, we tend to default back to the only things that we know. We just go back and do whatever we used to do before when we stumble and fail. That doesn't ever work out either. Because the intention is to move forward, not backward. And Peter's just defaulting back to what he knew. He didn't know what else to do. He denied the Lord three times. Jesus is dead. There's all these stories of him being alive from the dead, but it's just too weird to really believe at this particular point. So I guess we'll just go fishing. That's what we used to do. That's what we did before. So we'll go and we'll do it again now, and you see the results. Sometimes we tend to default back to the only things that we know. But Jesus wasn't going to let Peter do that. See, Jesus' restoration of Peter was not only intentional, he had already predicted it. See, back in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, Jesus told Peter that when he returned, that he should encourage his brethren. Jesus already told him he was going to fail. He said, after your failure, I've got work for you to do. I don't think Peter caught that. I don't think he was paying attention to that. Jesus knew that Peter would fail. So we see our failure as, well, we see our failure as failure. 
It's bad. Failure is bad. But it would seem that God takes a very different view of our failure than we do of our failure. Anybody here ever failed at anything ever? Yeah, okay, I get it. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and I'm quoting the New International Version, the NIV. I love the NIV. I'm NIV positive because uh, I think it's a good translation. Um, I think it's very workable and very usable. And um, some call it the newly inspired version. I, I like the NIV. Um, I'm preaching from the New King James, but I like the NIV. I study out of it all the time. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we have this, this encouragement that we are to run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Run with perseverance. We get that. Race, we get that. It's a marathon, not a sprint, right? We get that. But we, what we miss sometimes is the part where it says that it's marked out for us. Okay? Who marked it out? Well, if it's marked out before us, we're not the ones that went down and marked it out and then came back to the start line. He's the one. God is the one that marked out the path that we now run on. So if he's the one that marked out the path, doesn't it make sense to you that he knows what's on the path? That would include our victories as well as our failures. So he knows our failures right around the corner. And right around the corner, not only does he see our failure, he's already got his provision right there for us, waiting for us at that point of failure. Do you think, honestly, that you ever take him by surprise about anything? Come on, friends. So if our failures, listen, if our failures don't derail God's plan for our lives, why do we let our failures derail us. Right? Our failures don't derail God's plan for our life. Don't let your failures derail you. You don't have to. It would seem that what Jesus wants for us is to fail forward. Yes, I failed. Yes, I did the wrong thing. Now, let's learn from that. Let's accept that for what it was, my failure. I see it the way that God intends me to see it. Now, I'm going to move forward as a result of it. I'm going to move forward in spite of it. I'm going to move forward because of it. Because I certainly don't want to stay right here. Jesus wants us to fail forward. Learn what only failure can teach you and keep moving forward. I think our greatest failure is to let our failures defeat us. And they don't have to. See, in every one of these little scenarios about the Apostle Peter, his life was further transformed by each encounter with Christ. Every one of these scenarios, we didn't even get to Pentecost. But in every one of these scenarios, Peter's life was further transformed. It's almost like, I thought about it, I don't know if this is good or accurate or anything. It's almost like... Um, a playing pinball, and you know where the ball rolls around and then hits the bumpers and bounces off in another direction. Sometimes that's what these experiences are like. They're bumpers that we bounce off of, and we head in a new direction as a result of these failures and these trials and these tribulations. In each one of these situations, Peter could have sat down and quit, and he didn't. He even tried to, and Jesus wouldn't let him. The fact is, Jesus would not let him stay the same. Jesus will not let you stay the same. Each and every step in your Christian life has meaning. It's got purpose. But these lessons are not the textbook variety. Everything's different. He's in control. These are things that can and should springboard us up to the next step. To level up. Not level off. Not fall off. But to level up. Every failure is a temptation to not even try the next step. We start to think that the next step or the step that we're on is good enough. I don't have to take the next step. Not true, you do. If you're content or growing content with your spiritual life, you should be alarmed at your own condition because it's time to level up. Peter went on to be massively used by God in amazing ways, in spite of all he put himself through. But Jesus simply wouldn't leave him alone, and Jesus isn't going to leave you alone either. We must grow, and maybe the trials that you're going through right now, the trials that you're going through right now, are designed specifically to shake you up and to wake you up 
out of your spiritual lethargy and get you moving forward again. See, when God is at work, no one stays the same. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, it's comforting and terrifying at the same time to know that you are not going to leave us the way that we are. Lord, there's a part of us that really desires to be different. There's a part of us that's afraid of how you're going to do it. Lord, help us to fear not because of your great love for us. Lord, even as we're praying right now, if, if any have joined us here this morning that don't know you, I pray this would be the moment of their surrender. Even as we're all praying, if you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Christ. You can right now because he is ready to begin that great work of transformation. And he will not quit. He doesn't have any unfinished projects. He'll see you all the way through to the very end. And if you've never surrendered your life to him, you can do that right now. And it's as simple as a prayer. Remember, you're not joining a religion. You're not joining a church. You're entering into a relationship with the God that made you. And it's a simple prayer. It's just got to come from your heart. You have to mean it, and he knows whether you mean it or don't. And he just might pray something like, Jesus, I need you. I know that I failed. I know that I've sinned. But I believe that you died for me and rose from the dead. Now forgive me. Cleanse me from the inside out. I surrender my life to you. Now come into my heart and dwell there. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might live for you all the days of my life. Some of you may have joined us here this morning too as we continue to pray and you've been defeated. You've been beat down by your circumstances. And maybe it's been going on so long or you've been beat so far down you don't think you're ever going to get up. It's not true. You will. Because he can enable you to do the impossible. If you need to walk on water, he can do that for you too. Trust him for the next step. Lord Jesus, you know the failures in all of our lives. Now, once again, Lord, just grant us that great reminder of the repentance that you have for us. The opportunity to fall forward instead of fall down. We need your help this morning, each and every one of us, Lord. Because I know for me, and I can only pray this for me, Lord, I want to level up. I want to fail forward. I want to keep on moving. I don't want to fall back. And I need your help, and we all need your help for that. And we trust that you will help, because we ask it from you in Jesus' name. Amen.